So now it's really time to start. Uh, thank you for your patience. Um, uh, welcome again. Uh, it's my pleasure to be your host today and also moderate this workshop organized uh, by the EU-funded project uh, USERT. As you can see, we have specifically extracted the digitalization ingredients uh, of USERT as today this is the, the main theme of uh, Clima Congress. Uh, USERT in general, uh, I know some of you in the room uh, know already USERT, uh, but for those that don't, uh, we are an EU-funded project uh, that works on uh, the evolution of energy performance certificates. Uh, we have uh, a few very important ingredients, uh, like the set of EPB standards supporting the convergence. We have performed ethnographic research to understand better from people what they want from EPCs and what they should deliver. We are looking also at this digitalization side, uh, what digital tools we should use uh, to make this evolution happen. And of course, uh, we are promoting the inclusion of uh, indoor environmental quality indicators, uh, building smartness like the smart readiness indicator and so on. My colleagues will go in more depth. But basically, um, we are not alone. There are many other projects. We are 11 in total, uh, funded by the European Commission to support uh, this uh, activity. And as you know, now with the revision of the EPBD, the energy performance certificates and, of course, the calculation methodology behind are becoming, uh, in a way, the foundation of everything that will happen in the next decades uh, when it comes to building new buildings, renovating the building stock. What's very important, and this is something that we've struggled a bit with, is to define the limit. Um, energy performance certificates are a policy instrument, and this means that you need to draw a line at a certain moment what they can actually take in. However, uh, what we've seen in the work we've done so far is that the energy performance certification schemes at national level can set the framework, and we have seen as well that you can add on services and basically this is what we will focus on today um, to see exactly how we can reap the energy performance certification schemes to the next level using digital tools to have additional services provided to clients as regular building professionals. We have today with us uh, a couple of partners, um, Pablo Carnero from IVE. Uh, he will uh, share with you uh, the indicators that we propose to be included in EPCs and how EPCs can become more interactive, more meaningful. <laughs> then uh, Dick Van Dijk will cover this aspect of convergence. Uh, as you know, there are many uh, uh, calculation methodologies at national level and the set of EPB standards can greatly help and support this convergence. Uh, Nicolo Mignani from ISSO, unfortunately he couldn't join us today, uh, however he prepared a recording uh, and he will give you an overview on these add-on services, digital tools that can be basically used uh, uh, plug and play in your day-to-day -day activities. And then we have uh, a couple of external speakers that are not part of the user consortium, uh, but based on their work, we build some of our digital tools uh, to avoid reinventing the wheel and basically go farther together. And we have one of the EPB centers, EPB experts, Laurent Socal. Uh, he will talk about measured building performance and operational rating that would complement the already existing asset rating. They, it's not either or, it's all of them. <laughs> And then we have Pavel Vargotsky, uh, who will present a holistic IEQ uh, assessment tool. And of course, the juicy part, we want to talk to you, how you feel about all these things and how can we can work together and take this uh, at national level and bring it into reality. So the first speaker, Pablo Carnero, please, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Um, I will start uh, very quickly because I need to <laughs> run to another parallel session afterwards. Uh, but I'll be here for the discussion uh, later on. Uh, so yeah, as, as Andre mentioned, I'll present the user-centered uh, effective indicators and also the integration of those indicators in this uh, next generation dynamic EPC, uh, which constitutes part of uh, user's proposal. Yeah, this has already been said. I'm an energy engineer by training, and I work at the uh, research and development 
department at IVE, at uh, Valencia, Spain. So what we propose in user is this uh, set of added value holistic indicators contributing to this rebirth of the next generation of EPB assessments. And as well, we not only propose a set of indicators, but we also propose a way to integrate them in a dynamic and hopefully digitalized energy performance certificate report. Uh, what we did at the project was uh, learn from the ethnographic research performed at each of the 11 partner countries that were involved in USERT with a view to getting a clear view of the needs and expectations of both experts and non-experts uh, when it comes to energy performance certificates. By experts, we could think designers, architects, engineers, in general EPB assessors. And by non-expert users, we would be speaking about building owners, tenants, and some other final users that, although they interact with energy performance certificates, they don't necessarily have a technical background to fully understand such things as primary energy or kilowatt hours per square meter or, or those sort of indicators. Um, for, more indi for more information, you can refer to the deliverables that are available at, at user website. As well as this ethnographic research, we also moved to uh, doing a detailed indicator mapping at micro level identifying a path towards this holistic indicators. And, and for that, we analyzed a, a bunch of energy voluntary certification schemes, as, as you will see afterwards. Um, so yeah, after doing that sort of analysis, we came to the, to the findings, to the briefing that we needed to answer as user. Um, we got the sort of mandate that we needed to make EPCs more intuitive, and also being able to influence behavior of users so that gave us the idea that we should uh, include indicators covering items such as health, safety, convenience, well-being, and comfort because they were very valued by final users. So we found, as many other projects have, have found in the past, that energy and you know, euros or savings are not the only drivers for final users when it comes to upgrading their buildings towards uh, any kind of renovation that we hopefully would manage to uh, step up to the deeper innovation level. And also we should uh, accommodate a wide scope of use. So offer several levels of complexity, depending on the type of user. Also adapting the type of user interface to this expert and non-expert type of users. Developing a modular design, which could be the foundation for a more digitalized report. Also uh, with a view of what Andre mentioned earlier in terms of building and other service layers on top of EPCs and also consider the variable building situation where we have different situation when we are speaking about new buildings, existing buildings, or even uh, major renovated buildings. So user TPC structure answering to that challenge um, is built to behave as a repository of indicators and complementary data. Um, so depending on the type of user, some or all the information is disclosed. We envision that we have this pool of data and the expert user may be appealed to or understand all of it. And that's why we are, you know, at first giving all the information in the EPC report, as we'll see later on. But a non-expert user may be um, more appealed to by EPCs if they are given a small set of information that with a language is adapted, doesn't have two complex indicators, but in the, at the same time, it may be able of triggering that deeper innovation that, that we aim to, to reach in the future. So with regards to the indicators, user certification scheme considers four dimensions of indicators. The usual energy performance, but we also include the smart readiness, indoor environmental quality, and cost. And their inclusion in user CPC report is sensitive to the assessment type. As Andrei was saying, we are not only um, you know, relying on the calculated EPC report or calculated EPB assessment, but as, as and, and Lorenzo Cal will get into details later on this, we also envision having the possibility of a measured EPB assessment, which in turn may populate a measured EPC report, right? So as we can see, the calculated EPC report has all the information, almost every indicator except for the cost, because when we are speaking about an asset rating, we felt that providing a a standardized cost um, may be misleading to a final user without technical background because most definitely it will not coincide to the energy cost from the energy invoices and we don't want to you know promote untrustworthiness on this on the EPCs. 
um, in comparison, we have the that the cost and the measured EPC may be easier to to include as you know probably one of the input data sources for measured EPB assessments maybe the smart metering data or the energy invoices themselves. Um, I'll present now a an example of what the calculated EPC report would look like. As you can see, there's two kind of reports: um, the professional report, which is at your you know, at the left of the screen, and the user's uh, report. Um, I'll I'll move on to the different pages of the EPC report now. But as you can see, we have some contextual information, building information, some pictures. We have adapted the template in a way that it responded to the findings of the ethnographic research with a view to you know, making EPCs more appealing to, to users, more visual, more, more interactive. Uh, the first pages, there is no difference between the professional report and the user report, but note that there are no um, technical units. Uh, we are speaking about the EPC scale, and we're not giving any information whatsoever in terms of what is the consumption of the building per kilowatt hours per square meter. Of course, that is hidden behind, and that is used to place the building in the EPC rating scale, but we don't necessarily disclose that indicator in a way that a final user without any technical background will just receive the information of whether the building is, you know, wh what is the position in the scale, per se. Apart from the energy performance, we have the thermal score, which uh, is proposed to be calculated with the Aldrin uh, thermal score, as we'll see uh, later on, and also the smart readiness indicator, in a way that the three main indicators of the calculated EPC report can give information to the user uh, in order to guide them for a some kind of renovation action. And with regards to that, if, if we are speaking about an existing building, then this additional page will pop up of of the of the on-site visits performed by the EPB assessor. In the event that we are speaking about an existing building, of course, we would have a page dis uh, discussing the renovation scenario, which, of course, uh, should aim for the deep renovation, but we have included some renovation actions within the renovation scenario. And the different indicators are calculated for the whole renovation scenario, but also for each renovation action in a way that maybe a final user may not be appealed to go for the full deep renovation potential all at once, but would rather do a step-by-step -step renovation, and that's the, the there the information is provided along with the, with the cost of each renovation action and of the renovation scenario as a whole. Um, right here, the user's report would be finished, so we are speaking about three-page report with a front page, and if it's an assistant building, we would add two more pages, one discussing, discussing the on-site visits and another one discussing the renovation potential. Um, but the professional report has more information that has been hitting, let's say, in the back end of this EPB assessment, and that is the information that is going to be disclosed in the professional report uh, later on. So right now, note that the, the information that's going to be presented from now on only is included in the professional report and not necessarily on the, on the non-expert user's report. So we would have overall EP indicators, not only covering uh, energy performance, but we also have some indicators of summer thermal comfort, winter thermal comfort, and also uh, domestic hot water thermal comfort to ensure that the calculations are performed in a way that a enhanced, virtually enhanced energy performance does not um, is not balanced out by a lack of comfort in the building. Also, renewable energy indicators. Um, we have energy needs, and here we included, uh, unfortunately, I can not use the animations here, but uh, you, you can find the, the interactive PDF file in the user website. This intends to showcase what would be the potential, one of the potentials of a fully digitalized EPC in a way that, you know, by clicking on, for instance, the heating share of the energy needs, you would get further detail in saying, okay, what is the element of the building envelope that is contributing the most to my high energy, uh, heating energy needs, for instance, right? And in the end, you may move on to the OPAC envelope and you would get information about what is the orientation or the type of wall, for instance, that is being responsible for the greatest share of energy needs and in turn should be the first one tackled uh, when pursuing a, an envelope renovation, for instance. Um, similarly, to the energy use, we would be speaking here of energy use per energy vector in each of the EPB uses 
considered in the EPB assessment. We'd have also not only overall indicators, but also partial indicators covering the opaque envelope, the glazings, also the thermal bridges, and the air tightness. Um, for this indicator, since for the design of this uh, EPC report, we have already considered the proposal of the recast of the EPBD that is that was uh, you know published for public consultation. So this template also has taken into consideration the latest findings with regards to that. Uh, we would include partial indicators covering the technical building systems, also with a you know a a drawing or a schematic. Uh, representation of the technical building systems, and not only with regards to the thermal installations, let's say, but also with um, you know electricity production, storage, and such. Lastly, we would include more detailed information about the other main indicators that were included, and in the calculated EPC report, uh, such as the smart readiness indicator, not only with the smart readiness indicator for the whole building, but also with additional partial indicators per the domains and the impacts. Uh, using the latest version that was developed by the by the technical group um, developing this proposal of smart readiness indicator. And lastly, we would also have the Aldrin thermal score, which constitutes the main consideration of the indoor environmental quality as a mandatory indicator in, in usage. And, and here, you know, we we managed to collaborate with other projects in following the spirit that Andre was mentioning that user's intention was not to you know, reinvent the wheel, but rather to build up or capitalize a valuable, valuable uh, initiatives in the past that have been proven successful and that we consider that they can do a, an amazing job here. Mm. So this will be it with regards to the, to the EPC report. Uh, as you can see, the, prof the length of the professional report is, is way greater than the user report. That is an, our value proposition in terms of responding to many users in the different countries that told us that when they see the EPC, very often they become you know, overburdened and overwhelmed with all um, a lot of information that in the end they don't necessarily understand. So that is our take on this. Um, thank you for your, for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions at the end of the, of the session. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo. Uh, it's now uh, time for Dick Van Dyke uh, to guide you how our team l in his charge is leading this convergence of calculation methodologies. Thank you, Andre. Um, yeah, so I'm Dick Van Dyke. My background is uh, that I'm an expert at the uh, EPB Center. And I'm also, uh, as one of the other tasks I have, uh, coordinating in ISO uh, all the work on the standards on the energy performance of buildings. It's the ISO 50, uh, 52000 uh, family of standards. Um, so, um, yeah, the title, user facilitates the practical implementation of the set of EPB standards. So, uh, evidently, uh, it's uh, it's about the uh, EPB uh, standards, so I need to uh, give you a brief introduction for those of you who are not so familiar with the uh, uh, and ISO standards uh, on the energy performance of buildings. So, <coughs> um, so I will explain that later. So the proposal is to uh, in usert is to come to a converged calculation methodology based on these uh, SEN and ISO standards. And the prime uh, goal is to have the information necessary for the energy performance certificates, as you already understood from Pablo, and also for the benchmarking and checking compliance with the minimum energy performance requirements. So that could be the label, uh, the indicator of, on the label and so on. Um, and um, so you would say, okay, but if you have these, uh, this set of standards, then, then you just say, okay, take these standards and it's done. And m my job now is to explain that uh, there is some work to do there on the national level and on the convergence between the countries, even if you accept uh, the uh, set of uh, EPB standards from Senate ISO. 
Um, yeah, so why is it important to converge? Then we first have to look for what what's actually a, a calculation methodology. And then, of course, you say it's the, the formula, <coughs> uh, the algorithms, but that's only part of it. So you have the calculation method, indeed, the formula and the algorithm, but you also need to uh, agree on the definitions, so the terms and definitions. And you also have to agree on the indoor and outdoor conditions, and if you have a uh, calculation methodology, it, those are the assumed indoor and outdoor conditions. And for the calculation method to come to the energy performance of buildings, this ends up in um, the energy performance value, so say kilowatt hours per square meter, uh, in, uh, for instance, non-renewable primary energy. Uh, but then again, wha what does it mean? It's a number. Um, and the number has only a meaning if you can compare it with benchmarks. So you need benchmarks, reference values, to give a meaning to this energy performance value. So in the end, if you have a different methodology, so if the definitions, even one of the definitions is different, or the calculation method is different, or the assumed conditions are different, then you have a different uh, meaning and you cannot compare the energy performance. Um, well, s then you have differences of, uh, uh, of different kinds. So you could have some differences which you can solve by conversion so that you can have a, um, an output like the, the energy performance value uh, with some set of conditions like climatic data, some assumptions on the primary energy conversion factors, so the weighting factors, and then you want to compare it to another country where they have other climatic conditions or other assumptions on the um, weighting factors for the primary energy, and then because you have a calculation method, it will be possi <coughs> possible to convert um, the one to the other, and then you have a comparison, for instance, using a reference set of weighting factors and the reference climate. Um, but that's only in specific cases uh, possible. If you have differences in your algorithm, you cannot use the same al the, the, the algorithm for, the, for this comparison because you have different algorithms and becomes much more complicated than a black box. Uh, so I spent a few minutes to on this because it's important for the convergence of uh, the methodology. Um, so the set of uh, standard ISO uh, EPB standards comprises a large number of documents in the scheme, uh, there are only uh, a, a, a limited number mentioned of those. Uh, the, the common uh, denominator is that they all fit for the building regulations, as I explained, for EP requirements, EP certificate. Um, and, um, but the, the good news is they are not all needed for the calculation. There are, for instance, uh, standards on inspection, standards on a specific, uh, uh, very specific uh, components and so on. So, and the other good news is it's a modular approach. It's very transparent. You have the different um, uh, services uh, well organized in different sets of uh, standards. Um, so for each expertise, you can go uh, into uh, one of the subsets of the modules, and e uh, even behind this, um, the modules you see here, you have sub-modules uh, guiding you through different uh, elements of the calculation process. Um, and then, again, uh, as a next step, you can, even from the calculation standards, you can select a number of key standards, to uh, to give you a starting point for your for your understanding of the standards and for the calculation, and um, so you have the overarching standard uh, ISO 52000 Part One, which gives you uh, the overall energy performance. That's the top of the pyramid. Um, in order to get the, the to, to, to come to this overall energy performance, you need the energy uses from the systems. So we picked a few important systems here. It's the uh, ventilation systems and the airflows uh, needed for that. It's uh, the frame uh, work standard on the heating and domestic hot water systems. And we also picked the heat pump uh, standard uh, 
because the heat pump is a very uh, promising technique, an important uh, technique, uh, but it's complex. You have very d quite a different uh, number of types. It's a complex relation with the product data. And, um, and also it's uh, uh, the performance of a heat pump is uh, interacting with uh, the uh, engine needs in the building and the temperature of the, the building. So it's, uh, and, and the outdoor climate of course. And so it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's an important standard to, to, to take on board uh, in this set. And uh, so uh, I mentioned already the energy needs. So that's the 52016 part one, calculates the energy needs for heating and cooling and indoor temperatures. So it's also the basis for the thermal comfort, which is important. And uh, as you see uh, on the left on in the pyramid, you um, uh, have uh, interactions between the energy needs and the energy use of the systems. And then at the bottom you see uh, the boundary conditions and the product and component data. And we picked two important ones here. One is on the climatic conditions and the one on indoor conditions. Uh, uh, so the indoor conditions are the conditions uh, of use for the different space types you might have in a building like an office, uh, restaurant and what, uh, what you can have. Look around in this building and you see what I mean. Then the finally you have two post-processing standards at the, at the right. So uh, they convert the energy performance into indicators, uh, the basis for requirements and the ratings. And, um, and the other one is on partial indicators on the building fabric, the energy needs, and also the uh, thermal comfort. So, um, yeah, then you would say, okay, uh, now I, I have all the information, I can do the, the calculations. Well, actually the set of EPB standards is, a not, is not a one size fits all because um, uh, specific options have been built in, in each of these standards to enable to tailor the uh, methodology to the national or regional situation. That has to do with climate, culture, building traditional topology, policy and legal frameworks. Um, yeah, and if you want to know more, you can find on the EPB Center website uh, uh, videos, webinars, and so with explanations on this. Uh, yeah, and if you take these 10 selected standards, how many of these kind of choices are there? Well, even in these 10 standards, you have 238 choices. So that's quite a lot. Um, and so what we did in, in USERT is uh, to categorize these choices, and we picked out 44 tables which are important, and um, we specifically worked on these to see uh, how we can converge, uh, making more uh, unified choices on, on this, these aspects. And then just to give you an idea, so there are uh, quite a number of choices which are policy choices, like the, the weighting, the primary energy weighting factors, for instance. Um, there are two choices on categorization, I'll come back to that, on post-processing, so the kind of indicators you, you choose. And uh, then there are five of the choices are very critical for the calculation tool development, and I can reveal already one of those is whether you take an hourly or a monthly uh, calculation uh, step for your, cal for your uh, methodology. Uh, so uh, in USERT, as I said, the main uh, job was to, to see how we could convert these uh, choices. And so here I'll, I'll just pick a, a number of these choices to give you an idea what kind of uh, important things uh, are involved. So with regard to pre-processing, a very important choice is about the space categories. So uh, again, imagine this building, how, how do you divide this building in different types of spaces? You have assembly rooms, you have office rooms, you have corridors, uh, you have a restaurant and so on. So in some countries you see that they make a distinction between all these uh, different types of spaces and then you get a very precise calculation. Other countries say, well, but these, place, these spaces can change over time. And um, so uh, we 
take them all together into a, a, a more lumped uh, categ category. And you can imagine that if you uh, specify for each of these space types different conditions of use, like uh, required uh, ventilation rates, uh, occupancy, uh, uh, temperatures, and so on, then you get different results. And there you are. So uh, the other one is a, f a very evident one, the building services you include in your calculation. So heating, cooling, ventilation, domestic hot water, lighting are the obvious ones, although for lighting for residential buildings there might be a difference in countries, but you could also include uh, elevators, uh, transport in buildings or, or not. Uh, specification of the uh, area, the floor area, useful floor area in the building is an extremely important factor. If you have just a 10% difference in the uh, calculation of the floor area, you have an immediate effect on 10% difference in your energy performance. Um, and the specification of the perimeter, so where you draw the boundary of your of your building for the calculation. And I guess I have to speed up because I take uh, a lot of time for, for this, but uh, these are quite important ones. The other one imp important is whether you if you uh, look into a building and for instance you have a, 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 a bedroom in, in, in a residential building and there's no heating system, uh, do you uh, consider that space as n not using any energy because there's no heating system? Or do you say, oh no, we, are, we, we uh, uh, want to have an energy performance based on standard conditions, so we have to assume standard conditions also for this bedroom, so we assume a, a default heating system. Well, that's a big discussion. Um, it's also in, in, in Pablo's work, it's uh, covered, he didn't mention it, but it's an important thing to say for, okay, for this type of information, we uh, take an assumed system uh, to, get, um, uh, to, to be comparable with other buildings, having the real asset of the, the, the building, and in others, uh, for other applications, we take uh, what's present uh, as a system. But if, of course, if, uh, for instance, a, a cooling system is not present in a certain uh, space, then you can get comfort problems, and so this is again linked to how you rate the, co the comfort and how you measure, calculate comfort. Um, so, um, yeah, other choices are of course the, the climatic data set and the conditions of use I already mentioned. Um, re with regard to the calculation pro procedures itself, the primary energy and CO2 rating factors, the hourly or monthly calculation procedures, uh, hourly calculation procedures, uh, uh, we were convinced already that this, this was the way to go. We are very happy that in the EPBD proposal this has been confirmed. Uh, and if you have hourly calculation procedures, you have less problems with the matching factor of the produced and used electricity in your building um, to, uh, to avoid an over-optimistic uh, uh, as uh, EPB, EPE assessment. Uh, if you have a surplus of PV in your building and you take into account the exported uh, energy from, uh, from this PV in your uh, appreciation. And um, yeah, some other details on post processing. It's, um, yeah, so how do you take into account if you have an, uh, have an overproduction of PV at a certain moment? Do you appreciate that in your, in your energy performance? Or do you say, no, that uh, goes to the grid and that's another, uh, another thing? And the types of indicators, which was already covered by, uh, by Pablo. Uh, so the conclusions, um, the most important EPB standards for the calculation of the overall energy performance has been selected. Have been selected from these, we analyzed uh, all these uh, tables and uh, took out the most important ones and uh, made a proposal for choices. And, uh, and some of the choices have been selected and uh, because the project is still ongoing, there's still a final tune fine tuning to do with uh, the, the things that pa Pablo mentioned in his uh, uh, presentation to, uh, to uh, bring that back into the proposal of uh, these choices in the, in the uh, standards and then in a few months time you can find the final results on the website of USAP. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dick. We get now to Nicolo, and as I said, uh, unfortunately, he cannot be with us today. Uh, Martin, if you could uh, play the video in parallel, I would kindly ask you to sign the list of participants. Uh, if somebody didn't sign, could you please raise your hands and my colleague Zara would come to you? Okay, that's good. Uh, what I wanted to add um, uh, to Dick's presentation is that uh, he presented, let's say, the, the background and the steps we've made uh, to arrive also at the digital tool. Uh, we have a digital tool basically that supports uh, any country, at so decision making at national level, where you can, in which you can visualize the impact of these choices in the assessment of the building. It's not comprehensive, but it illustrates uh, for a few decisions that uh, member states need to make what's the impact on the assessment of the building and how uh, important is to have an informed decision when you make that. It's not just a whim that, ah, I want that because uh, I like it. Uh, you need to see what will be the impact uh, in the market. And basically this is a transition uh, because in this uh, video you will see um, the other digital tools that uh, we are, have prepared and are still preparing. Uh, Martin, whenever it's ready, you can hit the play button. Thank you. This presentation will focus on user tool 2, named the User Building Operational Rating Solution, which is part of a set of tools to be developed under the User Project Work Package 5 that ISO is leading. It consists of a series of tools that enrich the User Energy Performance Certificate, with additional information that will be displayed on it and that help make User Energy Performance Certification more reliable and understandable, even for non-expert users. The content of this presentation has been prepared by Nicolò Mignani, civil engineer working at ISO in the Netherlands. User Tool 2 has been designed to be a cloud-based service accessible through any web browser with an user account, enabling an evidence-based decision-making process. The idea behind User Tool 2 is to rely on several supporting tools, covering a wide range of topics which were spreadsheets initially developed in other projects and which have been translated into digital tools to support the User Energy Performance Certificate. These supporting tools are going to be presented in the next slides. I will start with the Aldrin Tail. It is within the scope of user as measured assessment and it is focused to cover indoor environmental quality indicators. So, the tool covers elements from temperature, acoustic, indoor air quality and lighting. It is flexible to not having information on all elements, although measurements are needed at least for one of the elements to be assessed, otherwise the tool cannot provide any measurement-free assessment. So, for instance, if measurements are available only on the temperature element, it is fine. It means that that part of the wall assessment can be assessed. In the end, what is obtained as output data is a general detail index, which would be a building covering the thermal environment, acoustic environment, indoor air quality and lighting, an overall indicator for the wall building indoor environmental quality. So there will be five indicators, one the tail index for the whole building and then one indicator for thermal environment, for acoustic environment, indoor air quality and lighting environment, if all the things manage to be assessed within the tool. The current situation is that the three Aldrin Tail spreadsheets related to dwellings, hotels and offices are being translated into web tools by Flexility and will be ready soon. Sensi tool is a translation of standard EN 15378-3 which deals with measure energy performance covering the heating and domestic hot water services and it has been developed in the framework of the Sensi project. 
This tool is within the scope of user operation assessment and actually just focus on eating because there is a current limitation in terms of EPB standards available. This tool is the resource that helps us bring in the gap between as measured assessment and operational assessment, going from as measured values to standardized and normalized values, which can serve for building comparison. For the scope of this tool, measurements are needed, and measurements understood as information like energy invoices, meta readings, maintenance report and on-site monitoring by building automation and control system, building maintenance system and then like. This tool allows for two different methods, the energy signature method and the seasonal data interpolation, which are very similar, although there is a, a small variation on the input data. However, the energy signature method has been the one translated into digital tool. As output, what is obtained is the delivered energy for eating and also an additional value which is the estimated indoor temperature. The Sensi spreadsheet related to the energy signature method is being translated into web tool by Flexility and will be ready soon. The small redness indicator is leveraging user and it's actually one very important element of user methodology and value proposition and belongs to the scope of user operational assessment. The tool covers heating service, domestic hot weather service, cooling service, control ventilation, lighting, shading elements or dynamic envelope, electricity generation and also it considers electric vehicles. It allows for two different methods. Method A, which is a simplified method that contains a list of selected services, and method B, the detailed method covering all services. Moreover, to carry out the tool, measurements are not needed. So, welcome to the SRI web tool. The tool starts with an introduction to the tool itself. Then we have, we have some mandatory information that must be filled in as I've already done in this case for the assessor information. Some of them are related to our own knowledge about the building we are assessing. So this is a residential building. In this case, for example, we have a residential building a single family house located in Italy with a total use for floor area less than 200 square meters, and so on. Then the methodology that we want to use must be chosen and the assessment date must be compiled. Now we can step to all the domains covered by the tool, which are heating, domestic hot water, cooling, ventilation, lighting, dynamic building envelope, electricity, electric vehicle charging, and monitoring and control. Let's start with the eating domain. First of all, we have to select if the uh, domain is absent and not mandatory for our assessment, if it is present, or if it is not present but mandatory for the assessment. Let's select that the eating domain is actually present in our building in this case. Then, for uh, each domain that is actually present in the building, there are several elements which depend also on the method previously selected. So, for method A, the elements which belong to the eating domain and that must be assessed are the heat emission control, the storage, uh, and shifting of thermal energy, the heat generator control, all except heat pumps, the heat generator control just for heat pumps, and the report information regarding heating system performance. Let's start with heat emission control that we will take as, a, as an example. If it is present, then we have to uh, select the level of functionalities from a list of possibilities ranging from level zero, no automatic control in this case, to a maximum of level of level four 
That is, in this case, means individual room control with communication and occupancy detection. Let's select, let's select level 3, individual room control with communication between controllers and to building automatic automation control system. If the share of the functionality level is less than 100%, please provide the functionality level that applies to the remaining surface area, always selecting from a list of possibilities. So this is just an example of what different functionality levels may look like for each element within each domain. And this would be in relation to the SRI calculation. So once the building information and all the domains are filled in, then the output data are obtained. The main one is the total SRI score, which is immediately obtained and which provide how smart ready the building is. We also have other um, partial output data such as the impact scores in terms of energy efficiency, energy flexibility and storage, comfort, convenience, health, well-being and accessibility, maintenance and fault prediction and information to occupants. And also some domain scores for each of the specific domains and services that I presented before, there is also an impact about how, sm how smart ready each, each of this section is. So, that is very valuable also to take some renovation actions in terms of increasing digitalization and connectivity of buildings. So, up to now, all the tools from other projects and or research initiatives and their current status within the user project have been explained. This is everything from my end. Thank you for your attention and feel free to follow up on the results of user project through the website and through other communication channels. Sorry for the quality of sound, it was varying. <laughs> Uh, Martin, while you put back the presentation, uh, so I just wanted to say that basically these are the main digital tools that uh, are being developed. Um, some of them will be uh, open for feedback soon or are now, like the SRI tool. If any of you is interested, uh, just let me know. We are working on it with the support team that was contracted by the European Commission and most likely it will be uh, sent to the member states that are testing the SRI. Um, just to have a valid tool that will be easy to use. Uh, however, all these digital tools will be uh, included in training. User project is closing by the end of this year. And in autumn, we will have training material for all these tools. It will be uh, made available in the national languages in the 11 user countries. So just follow us and uh, yeah, wait for the turn. And yeah, those of you that we will implement it together, I really look forward to making this reality. Um, Everything we did was with the mantra of going farther together as opposed to going fast alone. So now we have uh, two top experts, I would say, in, in, their, exp in their specialities. Uh, and we start first uh, with Laurent Socal, who will present uh, basically uh, the supporting uh, knowledge base that helped us develop the Sensi digital tool. Laurent, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so, uh, I guess this is forward, yes. So, my introduction, I think you can read this. I have uh, quite various experience, that's uh, the main information, and I'm responsible of several, uh, of the developing of several standards, and inter alia, this is about uh, the measured energy performance. Why measured energy performance? Uh, well, uh, some, somebody who was Lord Kelvin said uh, you can't improve it if you can't measure it. Well, if you don't know where you are, how can you approach a goal? I think that's quite obvious. And you can't be in control without any feedback. And if we think about what, uh, what, what, what's our real target, the real target is the actual energy performance, not the calculated. The calculated is on the paper only. 
and uh, we are building complex building. We are uh, we are uh, building sophisticated installation, and here we could speak about commissioning. And we calculate the energy performance with day standards. We we fill in tons of paper, tons of paper, and specification. How many of these figures are checked on site? And just compare the effort we did in calculation and the effort in measurement. So, do we really check? Do we compare? Calculate if we actually compare. It doesn't need to match exactly. The first step is, okay, what I obtain, does it make sense with what, what I've calculated? I know there is a different use, I know there is a different occupation. Is it at least consistent? And this leads to two questions. Was my assumption about the assumed operation representative, first thing. And then, what happened in reality? But we have to investigate these kind of things. So, uh, and more, we are speaking about improving the existing building stock, and we are issuing money for this. Do we check if this money has been correctly used or not? Or just trust on some calculation? So, I think that's obvious that we need. So, you can look for, probably I skipped, no, correct. Okay, if you look around about, we, we've seen before the number of standards about calculation. And if you now try to list the uh, measured energy performance standard, you, want, you will only find one, which includes something about the data source, of course, about rules to collect the data, rules to calculate, to process the data you measured, and to validate. And the origin is this yellow book, as you see, it was in situ measurements in building efficiency issued in Switzerland in the years 1980. Maybe a little bit too early, but uh, we have to read it a, a little bit more. And unfortunately, this standard is focused on only on heating and domestic hot water. Uh, the reason probably be is because here you have a stronger correlation which is easy to identify, which is the external temperature, which is not the case for other services where it is more complex. So. Uh, where does it come from? Well, uh, by, uh, from, from uh, simple things, like just having some measurements done on a building. So at some date, you do some measurement, you read your heat meter, you take into account your external temperature. This was before having the standard, so it's uh, just an Excel sheet. Now, if you collect the same data, you will do this in a more a smart and standardized uh, sheet of paper, but it's just the same thing. What is the interesting things? Uh, it is based, everything is based on a correlation between the power and the external temperature. And uh, if you make this correlation, instead of saying, is saying something that uh, consumption goes up and down along the year, uh, then you see, okay, there's a good correlation. You discover the colder, the, temp the, the lower the temperature outside, the higher the power you need. Okay, we need, we, I think we, we all uh, know this. Uh, but we should have a look at this and compare it. Why is this useful? So let's go on. First, you could do something more sophisticated. This is another element of the standard. One of the basic elements of the processing. Before doing any correlation, please separate data which belong to the same operating condition. And this first step is separating what is heating and what is non-heating. And the data in between, for example, because you have monthly readings, uh, if it's half heating and half not heating, just discard it. Otherwise, you will just have a mistake. So, quite a simple rule. And of course, you see, uh, that's, uh, that's examples also, that for heating, you have, oh, sorry, you have a very good uh, correlation, in this case, 91%, and for domestic hot water, zero. That's normal, because domestic hot water is not influenced or less influenced by outdoor temperature. And the interesting information is also this crossing point which uh, has, gives you a clue about indoor temperature, somehow. Uh, there are also other possible applications. If you, once you identify this curve from the, en from the measured energy, you have a quick way to size, for example, your generation system. This was one of the questions for the, in, the, in the first issue of the, uh, uh, of the um, Energy Performance of Building Directives. Please size your boiler. Well, if I have something measured and you can do this even in a quite more simple way with very little data, but that's a possibility. And you could do all the same, you could also build this picture with the design data. And so have a design based on 
the, the, the energy performance calculation. It's very useful for heat map. But you could do also in everyday's life. This is taken, this is big data collected from an energy service provider, and they have their baseline, what happens in the, in the, during the year, and they are looking forward to see, oh, what happens here? That's something I would like to replicate because I use less energy for the same probably service, unless it was because in that day the, the, the building was empty. Don't know. But it's interesting to investigate here what happened or here what happened. Outliers. These are the interesting things. Of course, you do not have the solution, but you have the clue. You have to aim. Here you have to look at it and understand. And then you can use this information. And this is also another example. How to check a renovation? Okay, just identify before, and this, and then, uh, oh, okay, they promise 30%. 30% by chance, now it is the deep renovation for the directive. Are we sure we'll get this? Okay, just go down 30%, you have a new baseline, and, oh, sorry. After the, after the, 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 after the, the renovation, we didn't get all what we expected. This happens because when designing, when calculating, everything goes the right way. Uh, in reality, mercy law. <laughs> everything that can be wrong will go wrong. So uh, probably you didn't consider, for example here they didn't consider they had an extended distribution uh, network which kept his, his losses uh, constant, so they overestimated. So this is quite simple to do. Uh, what's the problem? Why the standard is simple, we know, uh, and uh, this is because of the context. When you write standards, in other languages we say uh, uh, norme, something normal, what you can do every day. So what can you expect to find every day in any building around Europe? It's a meter, a gas meter. And then you have to hope that somebody went there and wrote down the value every month. So really, we, it's not easy to get this data. So what you can do if you have this, at least you can do the, what is in the standard. So it's the first attempt, and we know that extension and improvement are needed. And what are the main obstacles? Getting the information on building indoor condition and use. The problem is not climate. The problem is what the hell are you doing in that building? Is it occupied, not occupied, which is a set point? What are users doing? And this is why, where indoor sensors could help. Uh, then you have to separate non-APB uses. Uh, the difficulty is also that cost and reliability of some measurements. Probably IoT could help in the sense that uh, you collect the data. And not only collecting, if you uh, increase the number of measurement points, you have to collect the data at the same time for all measurement points. Otherwise, it's a mess to have a co the right combination, as the right to, to have all the information at the right at the same time step. And getting and storing the information on a regular basis and little or no information beyond energy delivery meters. Measured energy performance shall be part of the design of a building. Otherwise, there is quite little hope that we'll find what you need to do this calculation. And very often there is a dispute between measured and calculated. That's you need both for, 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 a, for a lot of reasons. Uh, of course, calculators is needed when you have a, a new building or a renovation. You don't measure before <laughs> having the building. That's obvious. Then if you have to analyze, the calculated can, can tell you where you have an issue. But then you need uh, the, the, the me measurement to, let's say, validate what you calculated. So you need bridges. And very often the bridge could be also something that you explicitly calculate so that, that you can compare. And you can take any, calc any monthly calculation, and any monthly calculation, what's that? It's an amount of energy which is used in one month, where you have an outdoor external temperature. It means that any APC can be turned into a design energy signature. And then you can superimpose the actual energy signature. And I think that even the court can understand this is not the same, without any doubt. So uh, you can do this already if you want. It's just a question of willing. So, and the, the, the idea behind is to be able to do this comparison, it could be interesting that in the calculation standard, 
it was, it's written how to produce a design NG signature so that you are ready then to compare with a measurement that is normalized or standardized, let's say. Mm. So that's a way to uh, put bridges. Actually, in 52016, there is already this kind of presentation. Of course, there is an ins installation in between, but it's a first step and to prepare for comparison. Mm. And more, of course, what's next? And of course, I think more attention to real world. And we have to complete this measure standard with other services. And it will be, of course, uh, much more complicated. And we have to take into account that the optimal performance is a quite narrow path on a sharp edge. So high performance buildings, you need careful attention to a huge number of details. And everything can go wrong. So then you have to check. You have to check during installation, during uh, commissioning, putting into service, and then during operation. So performance monitoring should be integral part of the design. And the full commissioning of the building and system is required if really you want to get these goals. And somebody should be responsible for monitoring, looking at the data, and reacting. Otherwise, of course, no action, no effect. It's all on the paper. And of course, IoT, we speak a lot of IoT and cloud storage. This is quite interesting. This is possible information, but then you need processing. This is possible data, sorry, but you need processing to get information, and then you need to make decision and react. Otherwise, it's not complete. So my conclusion, measured, has been measured energy performance has been neglected so far. They are both calculated and measured are necessary, and it's limited measured energy performance by what's available currently on site, and the missing piece is mostly what happens in the building, because this is a missing uh, element that can influence. And we need connection, which has to be prepared in the calculation and design standard. And I think in the, in the review of the directive, there is a good clue, because it's written that the measured energy performance is envisaged as a confirmation of what has been calculated. I think this is a good starting point rather than trying to have everything through the measured energy performance, which to me is not that uh, real possible. Of course, automatic data collection and storage and processing may help in the near future. It's only the beginning of the story. Let's see what happens tomorrow. And for the moment being, let's use these tools. That's quite instructive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurent. It's now time for Pavel Vargotsky to come on stage. And the clicker works again. Perfect. Pavel, please, the floor is yours. You need to change the camera. Yeah. No. My watch is uh, working differently, apparently. But anyway, um, thank you very much for an invitation. So I'll, be, I'll give you a tale about the tale and the predict tale. And um, this is a, um, uh, the uh, rating scheme that has been developed during the Aldrin project. And uh, it has been developed just before pandemic and it's time now to, uh, and we started to uh, promote it um, just before pandemic and then now after pandemic we continue to promote it, actually de further developed the idea. So uh, it's an attempt to rate indoor environmental quality. And uh, it's uh, an important attempt because we don't have uh, a tool in which, a standard tool that in which we could be uh, used to rate our indoor environmental quality. Uh, all other disciplines, um, that are related to humans, they have some methods of rating the quality. So the food uh, and the energy is assessed with this uh, labeling and water quality is assessed, but uh, we miss some sort of a standard uh, method of rating. So that is an attempt to do that. This is the first comment. The second comment is that uh, after you see this uh, tool, you may think, okay, it's extremely crude. And you can say, okay, I mean, it's obvious what they do here. But that was the purpose of developing the tool. It was a purpose to make it 
at the level which is sufficiently of a high quality, but is also crude, so it can be used. So we didn't want it to make a tool that is so sophisticated that no one can use it. We can, of course, develop such a tool, and, that, and that's our uh, ultimate goal. But our first goal was to have something that can be immediately applied and which provides good um, uh, as a rating of indoor environment. So um, I'm presenting here and then uh, together with me uh, the, the two persons that were uh, important uh, to develop the tool were uh, Corinne Mandel and Wenjuan Wei from CSTB. And of course, the, uh, the coordinator of the Alden project who actually uh, asked us to develop the tool and uh, further developed, Johan, uh, who is sitting uh, here in the audience. So thank you very much. I think it was um, uh, a wonderful experience to uh, have, it pos have it possibility to do that. So the background, so why we developed the tool. It is because the directive the last revision of the EPPB directive says that in Article 2A, it says that each long-term renovation strategy shall be submitted in accordance with applicable planning and reporting obligations and shall encompass several points, an evidence-based estimate of expected energy savings and wider benefits, such as those related to health, safety, and air quality. So in the project Aldren, we ask ourselves, okay, if we want to keep this mandate, how we can do that? So our objective was first to meet this mandate of EPBD when we were developing the tool. The second was that we wanted to document any improvements to our, uh, indoor environmental quality after renovation. And the third was to estimate potential additional benefits. So that's the reason why we developed the tool. And few words about the Aldren. Aldren was the project which uh, has um, an objective to create incentives for increasing the rate of uh, deep energy retrofits of hotels and offices in Europe. So it developed certain tools to uh, create those in incentives and in the end all the tools are included now in the uh, building passport. So um, uh, you can go to Aldren uh, webpage and to read about this because it's a very interesting approach. And one of those tools was actually a uh, uh, tail rating scheme. So what we did is we say um, in the beginning, okay, let's, let's use something that exists. So we didn't, uh, in the beginning, uh, we didn't want to develop the tool. So we said, okay, maybe there is something that we can actually adapt for the purpose of uh, rating uh, indoor environmental quality. So what we did is we looked at the, uh, what is in the literature uh, about uh, measurements of indoor environmental quality. So we um, collected information from different green building certification, standards, projects, and published work, and found out that actually there's about 100 different indicators that are used for rating indoor environmental quality of which the most are for the indoor air quality measurements. But nevertheless, there were, there were no standard sort of like indicators. There were some indicators that uh, actually were similar across the different rating schemes and projects and some were different, but there was no any standard method. So we said, okay, instead of doing this that uh, we will, um, because there was no nothing, and instead of trying to adapting what has been used, we said, like, why don't we develop something that can, we can consider from the very beginning? And this is when uh, the tail rating scheme was uh, born. And uh, we had discussion about the name, uh, but uh, in the end we discussed that maybe we could keep the name. Um, uh, so. Tail comes from the thermal, uh, acoustic, indoor air quality, and light, or uh, luminous environment. Uh, so uh, it's a quick connection. Tail also is easy to remember, so that we kept it. And the idea is that these are four components of indoor environmental quality, and each of these components should be rated uh, according to its quality. And this rating uh, should be represented by four colors, green, amber, yellow, and red. And uh, those colors will uh, reflect a um, certain quality level that matches the quality level that is described by the standard EN16798. 
Why this standard? Because this is one of the standards that is supporting EPBD. So we wanted to make this connection here. And that was a connection also to renovations and so on. And then depending on the quality of each of the components of the uh, indoor environmental quality, we, uh, we can determine the quality of the overall indoor environmental quality, which is the uh, Roman number in the middle, represented again by the color and the Roman number. And this number or this uh, quality is depending on the quality of each of the component. And the worse quality uh, of the components determines the overall quality. And of course, this can be debated whether it should be such a um, uh, such approach, but the reason, uh, uh, there were two reasons for that, and one reason was to create an incentive that there is no comprom comp we no do not compromise on any of the components. And the other one that we really don't know how those components uh, can be combined. So we decided an approach that is used in the ambient air quality. So the worst, uh, so it, when you hear about the ambient air quality, for example, for Rotterdam today, so this is the quality of the one of the parameters that define uh, in ambient air quality. This is the worst. And also, if you talk about uh, uh, water quality, always the worst parameter defines the water quality. So, so this is uh, uh, the very similar approach that in the other fields. So what we did is then um, we had to define. So the idea was that this. Uh, um, 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 rating scheme is used to assess the performance of the building in use. So um, it's the performance metric. So we go to a building, assess the performance of a building, and when it's used, not at the design stage or not at the when it's empty, it's just when it's used. And, um, and also, it, originally, we planned to use it as a, a comparison between the condition that is before renovation and after renovation. We believe that it can be also used universally, independently whether you do any renovation, but it has to be checked. But that was our intention. And then you need to define the parameters that characterize each of the component. So we decided those parameters, 12 parameters, that are listed here, of which 10 are measured, which is temperature for thermal environment, noise for acoustic environment or sound pressure level, for air quality, CO2 ventilation rate, formaldehyde, benzene, PM 2.5, radon, relative humidity, and for light, illuminance. So these are measured. And then for indoor air quality, we also have observations for the mold. And for, uh, for luminous environment, we have also uh, daylight factor, which is uh, simulated, and um, daylight factor cannot be measured. Actually, it can be measured, but I mean, in order to define daylight factor, you need to simulate it. So basically, here is an example. You know, you, you assess by measurements those parameters before renovation and after renovation, and then you can rate the indoor environmental quality depending on the quality of each of the component and parameter that are measured. And then we said, okay, so that's the concept. We have parameters, uh, components, uh, rating, uh, rating levels, so the quality levels. We need to define also the protocol. So we developed also protocol, so how the measurements should be performed. I don't have much time to describe, but we said how many rooms should be measured, how long, in which seasons you need to measure, and so on and so on. All those parameters are included just to have it a complete tool that can be used. And then complete tool also means that you need to have the reference for the instrumentation that you use. And then we also defined what type of instruments should be used and how the, instru how the inst measurement should be used, whether it should be a spot measurement, continuous measurement, according to which standard and so on. We have a paper in energy and building that describes in detail all those parameters. And then, of course, you can say, okay, you have to validate it. So what we did is we validated it on a few buildings, uh, and um, then pandemic broke, project was over, and we were not able to continue. But then Johan, the coordinator of that project, said, look, guys, you developed the, mat the rating scheme that... Um, that actually is good for the perform as a performance metric, but what about the designers? 
If you do the renovation, you need to have some tool that you can use during the design of the renovation. So they need to have a method in which they can rate or qualify the different the design uh, concepts and compare them and see whether they would be, uh, whether one will be better than the other one to continue with it. And this is uh, the time when the predictor was uh, born, which is the, um, the son or the, uh, I don't know, the, the daughter, or maybe, I don't know, it's just the, a part of the entire, you know, the tool in which um, um, is a scheme in which you can actually predict what would be the uh, rate, uh, quality level in a, in a building uh, f following the uh, tail principle at the uh, uh, renovation or design of the renovation. And here on the right, you see which parameters are included. So here we include parameters such as temperature, noise, CO2, formaldehyde, benzene, PM 2.5, radon, relative humidity, illuminance, and daylight factor. And these are the parameters that can be modeled. So in here, in during renovation design, you basically model those parameters with the existing um, modeling tools, and then there are modeling tools that allow that, um, and they have, been, um, they have been used for that purpose. So, um, so this is something that, and then of course, we decided, well, let's see whether uh, the method that we develop is sensitive enough to detect the differences. So we uh, subjected Predictail to, um, um, Sorry, uh, uh, yeah, it's subjected the predictile to um, um, test to see whether it will pass, so whether it can predict that there are changes. So what we did is we had a base scenario and then we created two scenarios in which we only, uh, that were designed to change the energy performance of a building, so intermediate energy consumption and low energy consumption, and then two scenarios in which retrofit was focused on improving indoor environmental quality. For example, uh, using low emitting materials, <laughs> increasing ventilation, and so on. And see whether by using a simulation tool, we can demonstrate, and then comparing with the uh, parameters included in the tail, we can see that there is a difference. And those simulations were done for one year, like you normally do for the energy simulations. And this is the tools that we used for simulation. <coughs> it's Trinces, Matis, uh, Akubat, and Fani. We believe that we can use any tool, but that has to be further, de <coughs> further developed. And we find out that actually the tool is sufficiently sensitive. And I don't have much time to look at this, but I mean, this is, you know, for those buildings in which we made measurements, because we could have the baseline for that um, uh, from the measurements, uh, so the office and hotel, we uh, run those different scenarios and these are two examples of low, uh, intermediate, uh, or maybe intermediate energy use and a high indoor environmental quality. And we can uh, just basically see that on some parameters we see the change, on some parameters we do not see the change. So it, we believe that the tool is sufficiently sensitive to detect those differences and guide the design process. So the question would be now, okay, would there be a similarity between what you predict and how the building performs in actually? So as it is also with energy performance, there will be performance gap. So we believe that, that sh we should not say, well, okay, if the building does not perform according to predict tail, it's uh, there will be performance gap. So, but the predict tail is to guide the process and the tail is telling you how the building is actually performing in the end. And there could be differences, and we need to understand if there are differences, what to do with it. So we developed tail and predict tail, and uh, we hope it will become a standard in the future, or just the beginning, and um, they will, the, the most important is that they will uh, start the process of um, uh, of innovation, because this is uh, exactly what we need. We need to start comparing the environments in different buildings and using the same methodology, and then in this way we will get more information about how they perform and further develop. I always give an example of, um, 
uh, I always give an example of an iPhone. You know, the, no one has developed the iPhone, now it's iPhone 13 in the beginning. They developed iPhone 3. Some of you might not even remember that. And uh, iPhone 3 was extremely uh, simple compared with the iPhone 13. But because they used the same platform all the way and get the feedback, they could further develop it, and now it is at a stage which is extremely advanced. And it will be probably even more advanced. So this is exactly with the tail concept, is that we start with a certain level which provides good information, and we will further develop, and that will lead to the innovation and advancement. So thank you very much. That is my presentation. Thank you very much, Pavel. Uh, as you have seen, uh, we were very ambitious. We wanted to make this session packed with uh, added value uh, knowledge, but we have run out of time, basically. So I know lunch is coming. Um, I'll just make a statement specifically for the Riva member associations that are here, quite numerous. Um, uh, similar to the census scheme, uh, the workshop you participate, uh, participated in yesterday, uh, uh, Martin, could you please put back the... Yeah, thank you. Um, we have the same idea, and it's exactly linked to what Pavel just said. So we would like to cooperate um, to roll out all these added value uh, assessments, uh, especially that we will have uh, supporting digital tools, uh, which will make it even easier and more attractive. And uh, basically, Riva EPB Center would be at European level, and we just empower you to roll this out in the market. And what we will create, which is virtually inexistent today, is exactly what Pavel touched, and thank you very much for that, Pavel, the feedback loop. And then we can go further and further and further and reach uh, tail 100. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe we don't need to make so many improvements. We'll get it at a certain moment, comprehensive. Um, so that was the overall statement. Uh, this is just the uh, opening of the dialogue. Uh, those of you that don't have my contact details, uh, just approach me. Uh, we can exchange business cards. And um, we could take one question per speaker. Um, if you have something very relevant to be answered, I could still connect you to them. You can always contact me for that. Uh, but we could take one question per speaker, or if maybe some of the speakers want to add something or uh, comment on what I just said, perhaps uh, we could also do that. So if there are any questions for one of the speakers specifically, or something even generic that the speakers could address. Okay, I guess not. So. That means that uh, they have been very, uh, uh, let's say, they are skilled, I know that, and they have conveyed the message. Yes, Pavel. Maybe this is an irrelevant question, but I, 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 want, to, uh, I want to understand uh, where was the voice recorded for the presentation from Italy? Was he in the spaceship, on the Mars, on the moon? Or maybe he transported, it because it sounded a little bit to me like in the old audio, old radio uh, broadcast, because it was something like from somewhere far away. So was it uh, uh, specially made so that people will have an attention and listen to it? That's really great, Pavel. It's always nice to close a session with an anecdote. <laughs> and yeah, um, my assumption is that um, he also works for Tesla, and I think he tested a new model around uh, Earth. And uh, I think he was just over Europe. The connection was a bit better, but still not good enough. <laughs> That's my assumption. Yeah, yeah, well, SpaceX, not Tesla, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, then uh, thank you very much uh, for having participated. A big thank you again for our speakers and maybe uh, a final round of applause for them. Thank you very much. And please f follow us to be kept in touch. And as I said, we will roll out a lot of activities this autumn in all the 11 user countries in national language.